welcome to episode 149 of the Postal Hub podcast. I'm Ian Kerr. Today we're talking about an exciting project in Vienna where phone booths are being converted into parcel lockers. Mario Mayatala, head of A1 Innovation, joins me in a moment to talk about the new A1 packet stations. Later in this episode, I'm going to talk about drones. Seriously, I am. But... I am, really. I'm going to talk about drones, and I'm not going to yell out drones are stupid at any point during... No, I won't. I won't. I promise. Anyway, coming up first, Parcel Lockers with Mario Mayatala from telecom operator A1. Joining me on the line is Mario Mayatala. Mario is head of A1 Innovation. A1 is the telecom operator in Austria and operating in a number of other countries, I understand. We'll stick with Austria for the moment, Mario. Mario, we're talking about a very interesting project that A1 kicked off recently um, about converting phone booths or public telephone booths into parcel lockers. So, Mario, tell us, how did A1 come up with this idea? Well, Ian, um, we have some internal innovation um, units. Uh, we call those um, um, initiatives entrepreneurs. This means that we are looking for, for teams to come up with uh, good ideas. And after some hurdles, we give those teams the freedom to uh, fulfill uh, their ideas. So it means we give them everything needed to bring the idea to the ground. And one of those teams came up with uh, this idea of uh, converting phone uh, booths into parcel lockers. And, uh, well, we said uh, that we would like to give those uh, this team a, a real chance. And um, we are now on the, in the beginning of, of this journey and have our first uh, converted phone booths uh, on the market. Now, we, as you mentioned, so you're just starting out now. So how many phone booths have you converted to parcel lockers so far? So far, we have four phone booths converted, but uh, that's just the beginning. So what we are, this is just a trial, but what we are looking for is uh, for bringing, uh, of course, additional uh, parcel lockers uh, to the public, to public spaces. But here we also have uh, the advantage that we have a lot of uh, space because we are uh, incumbent. So this means we have a lot of of branches here uh, where we can put additional lockers so it will be a mixture. Uh, some some phone booths will be converted, and on our other branches, we'll put uh, real big uh, path lockers. So when you mention branches, you mean like a, a retail shop that A1 might operate? Is that what you're talking about? A uh, retail shop is one, one possibility, but we have a lot of exchange offices uh, because we are also running the fixed uh, line network, and therefore you need a lot of uh, exchange offices. So this means we have... Uh, all over Austria, 1,200 exchange offices where we can also put uh, such a parcel locker. So uh, seen from a granularity, everything is here, and now we really need to, to roll it out. And so I imagine that uh, one aspect of this project is that the usage of public telephone booths is falling. And so that as a result, if you convert a few phone booths to parcel lockers, the public well, the public doesn't miss them so much because the public uses mobile phones. Is that one of the drivers behind the project? Um, that's also our driver. You're totally correct. Um, we have, uh, from a legal perspective, we have to run the phone booth uh, because um, the thinking behind is that in case of emergency, uh, someone still could need the phone booth, although we have a super high mobile penetration here in Austria, of course. But uh, that's the legal situation. But um, yeah, out of that, we thought that some of the, some of those phone booths which we uh, do not need from a legal perspective could be converted, and uh, this was uh, one of the drivers. Well, let's just talk about who then can actually deliver into the parcel lockers. Uh, I understand the Austrian Post is one of the partners, but you also partnered with an e-commerce marketplace. How does that all work? Uh, the basic idea was that we would like to do something that's really useful for the public. So meaning um, the the online delivery of, of parcels is dramatically increasing because everyone is going to the, to online shopping. And we wanted to do something also for the for the public, meaning something for the regional uh, economy. So this means that we start to cooperate with local 
uh, economy, meaning that the local stores also can put in there uh, their goods and that the, the customer can, can take it out of, of the parcel locker whenever needed, so 24-7. And we are closely working together with Spock. This is um, an app where everyone can sell or buy stuff from person to person. Uh, and uh, also for those customers, we enabled the lockers to be open and to be used. And so how does it work from the customer's perspective? Let's say a customer has sold something via this Spock um, app. How, how does it work? How are they able to then put a parcel into the locker? Uh, it's not included in the Spock app. Uh, if, if you are a Spock customer and you sell, for example, uh, your watch to me, then, of course, you need to register on the A1 uh, parcel locker app. Uh, and then you can place uh, the watch in the locker. And at the moment when uh, you receive the cash, which I have to pay to you uh, on your account, then you give me the permission to pick up uh, your watch that you placed in the locker. So um, it's, it's, of course, uh, everything transparent and registered. And uh, we also want that due to um, reasons of public safety. And so the person who's sold, in this case, the watch, can put the the watch in the in the parcel locker, and they pay and they pay the fee. For for C to C, there is no fee at the moment, so we made this uh, free of charge because uh, we think that this uh, also may reduce. Um, yeah, it's, it's convenient and uh, really drives the the business, and hopefully our numbers and the usage, and that's why it's C to C for free. And so, how long have the the parcel lockers been operating? And and have you had any early feedback from the public on whether they're popular, easier to use, or how how, how are they performing? Uh, well, we are online now. I think for uh, six weeks, and uh, the the response uh, in 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 the media and and uh, social media, and also the response from from the users itself, which we get uh, through the app. Is uh, really, really extremely positive. So we see that uh, we are here really easing a pain because everyone wants to ha- have your more convenience. Uh, at the moment, uh, if you're not at home, many, many parcels are being stored in some other stores. When you come home from work, then the store is closed, so you can't pick it up. So everyone is, is trying to ease the pain. And I think here we, we really have the, the right product at the right time, um, which brings a lot of convenience. And Mario, one of the problems or challenges, I suppose we have to say these days, um, with setting up a parcel locker network has been finding the real estate, first of all, um, and clearly you've solved the problem of finding the real estate by having uh, phone booths that you can convert. But there's also been the question of having power, having a shelter, uh, having a communications link. Can you just give us an idea of how, from a technical perspective, you're overcoming these challenges with this particular project? Well, uh, if we go to the uh, to the phone booth, then it, it's not that uh, it's not a, a real big pain because the phone booth anyhow has uh, power. Uh, and connectivity. If they wouldn't have connectivity, then we would take uh, IoT connectivity, means um, using simply the mobile web. Um, of course, we can do this as a telco. So, uh, regarding the actual phone booth, this is not a big issue. Uh, coming to other places, uh, here we have the advantage, as already stated, that we have a lot of uh, exchange offices, meaning a lot of, of, of places where we can put them. And, and there are, we also, of course, have power and connectivity. So, this part is the more easy part, which is the real harder part is getting all the permissions uh, and that stuff done because, uh, of course, you cannot place path lockers wherever you want. You have to have uh, an agreement with uh, the cities. Uh, you have to place them at the right uh, place. But as uh, our biggest cities in Austria are heading towards a smart city and smart city logistics, we have a lot of positive signs and uh, many mayors are keen on that so uh, also those um, hurdles can be overcome but that's, that's absolutely true you have to do this case by case so it's not um, you cannot go there and say okay i'm putting now uh, 200 pass loggers in the, in the in the bigger city and this is being done in in a, in a week uh, you have to head for for every permission uh, case by case uh, we mentioned earlier on that um, Austrian Post is delivering parcels into these uh, into these packet stations, the A1 packet stations. Uh, what's the future? I mean, are, are you looking towards having an open parcel locker network where any carrier can deliver? Or can you give us some idea of where you're heading with this? 
Well, actually, we are in a, in a very successful trial phase with Austrian Post. Uh, of course, Austrian Post is the biggest player on the market and uh, it's a very important player. So we would like to prolong this work together. And uh, always, we also would like to head towards um, a sustainable business model, which is good for both parties. But in general, of course, we are open to, to all carriers because uh, there is competition and there is a market. So we have to see where the journey will end up. Yeah. Well, there we have an insight into a new approach to rolling out a parcel locker network, taking some existing infrastructure that might be underused, converting it to parcel lockers, and also the potential to open it up to uh, not just the, the the local post but to other carriers. So in other words, making an open network, which is another another development that we're seeing in a few other other parts of the world. And I also like the idea of it being available just to members of the public to use these for um, for ad hoc parcel deliveries. It certainly is in making a, a, a new and innovative way of approaching the last mile in particular via parcel lockers. So Mario Mayatala, head of A1 Innovation, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And now it's time to talk about drones. And why now? Well, because UPS made an announcement last week that it will be setting up a new drone delivery service for lab samples and things like that, basically following in Swiss Post's footsteps. Now, Swiss Post first started trialling a medical drone delivery service in March 2017 in partnership with a company called Matanet. Now, at first, there were just these two hospitals in Lugano that were connected by drone and lab samples were being transported between the two and it's been expanded now to um, involve a number of sites across Switzerland in three different cities. So this was sort of the starting point for this and we're going to get to UPS in a moment. Before we do, I just want to quickly mention that uh, there was an incident with one of these drone deliveries. One of the drones crashed into Lake Zurich and when they found the drone. They found that there was a parachute still attached to the drone. Um, what happens in the event of a drone failure, uh, the the drone rotors will switch off and the parachute is triggered. And as it descends towards the ground, it draws attention to itself by hooting and flashing, which I mean, sounds a bit like someone I knew when I was younger, <laughs> but that's a whole other story. I think it's interesting, though, that the, the, the Swiss in this instance are dealing with a situation where a drone had a failure in midair. Um, it crashed to ground. There's obviously there's the potential uh, for injury for anybody who might be underneath the flight path. There's also the loss of those lab, lab samples. That's not to say that there wouldn't be a risk of loss of lab samples with a regular courier vehicle navigating the, the streets from one hospital facility to another. However, you know, there's that added bit of uh, loss there when a drone carrying me- lab samples will crash to the ground. Now, all of the drones were grounded while they worked out what caused the accident. But apart from that, Swiss Post has completed well over 3,000 medical deliveries via drone. So is that enough to convince a drone skeptic like me? Well, I mean, we're talking about a very specific use case here for drones. We're not talking about drones delivering parcels, which seems to be a lot of the uh, concept that people are talking about when they talk about drone deliveries. And let's be frank, drones are not going to be ringing my doorbell soon. Are they? They're not going to ring a doorbell and say, Ian, your package is here. Um, And they're not going to fly up the stairs or get in the elevator to come up and deliver it to my front door. Anyway, Let's get to UPS now. UPS has announced that it's going to do basically the same sort of thing, delivering medical samples via drones in collaboration with, well, you guessed it, Matanet. Now, this announcement came only a few weeks after FedEx uh, made its big announcement about the FedEx same-day bot. So is it really UPS trying to catch up with the neighbours? Well, I don't think that's the case here. Let's just talk a little bit about the service that UPS will be offering. It's But as I said before, it's the same idea that Swiss Post and Matinet were doing, connecting to medical facilities. And the idea is that by taking a direct route, more or less a direct route, the drones will be able to traverse that distance quicker than ground-based vehicles that could get stuck in traffic, 
uh, and things like that. Now, obviously, drones are also susceptible to the weather. Uh, drones won't be out there delivering when it gets too windy, for example. So there will still have to be some sort of a backup option available. Um, the, the drone will fly along a predetermined flight path, which will be monitored by a remote pilot and there will be fixed landing pads at each medical facility. Now, those of you who have been paying attention to drone delivery, and maybe you share my scepticism, may recall that this is not UPS's first uh, foray into drone delivery. It was doing um, del it was delivering blood, blood products to remote locations in Rwanda uh, a couple of years ago, 2016, in fact. And back in early 2017, it launched a trial of van-borne package delivery drones. Now, whatever happened to that? I haven't heard a lot about it. These are the kind of things that fuel my scepticism about, about drone delivery. But getting back to UPS, I mentioned before that I don't think this is just sort of UPS trying to keep up with the neighbours and FedEx's recent announcement of its ground-based delivery robot. I reckon this is actually part of a broader play from UPS because UPS has its eye on the healthcare sector. It's uh, recently been emerged that UPS is preparing to test a service that dispatches nurses, not via drone, you'll <laughs> be pleased to know, to vaccinate adults at home. And UPS has said that healthcare and life science logistics is a priority segment for them. So I reckon that's what's driving all of this. And of course, there's another company out there in North America who's dabbling in healthcare and pharmaceuticals. What's the name of that company? Well, it's Amazon, of course. So a little bit more pressure there for UPS to come up with some good technological solutions in the healthcare field. So looking at this from my viewpoint as a world-renowned drone skeptic, I can see that this is a potentially a use case that will work. I can see how it would work in good weather conditions. Yes, it will potentially cut out delays of getting those urgent lab samples or blood samples from one hospital uh, or laboratory to another healthcare campus, let's say. So there will be advantages there. Uh, so it's a very limited use case in, in another respect in that. Uh, it's not like a delivering the last mile for packages, and my scepticism in that respect remains. That's all for this episode of the Postal Hub podcast. Now, if you haven't already, please do sign up for the Postal Hub e-newsletter. It's a weekly email update that includes the latest podcast and any other articles or news items that I've written during the week. Go to thepostalhub.com and sign up there. And speaking of signing up, remember that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever you like to call it, on Spotify and on Google Podcasts. That way you'll get each episode downloaded to your device each week. If you're on LinkedIn, feel free to send me a connection request. Love to hear from listeners, but just please, as I say every week, please include a note to say that you're a Postal Hub listener and I'll straight away say yes, accept your invitation and we'll be friends on LinkedIn, which is almost as good as being friends in real life isn't it? So just include that message to say that you're a Postal Hub listener. And if you want to contact me about anything at all, really, just send me an email. My email address is ian at thepostalhub.com. I'm Ian Kerr. Thanks for listening in, and I look forward to your company next time on the Postal Hub podcast. <laughs>